Well, thank you for that, uh, for that very kind introduction. And I also want to thank the, the Show Me Institute for inviting me uh, here this evening. I really can't stress um, the value of places like the Show Me Institute to someone who writes for national publication, a journalist like myself, um, having an organization on the ground, uh, the state and local level, can turn to uh, either turning to their scholars, picking up the phone, or going on their website and uh, reading research papers and so forth so that I know what I'm talking about when I, when I try to explain these issues uh, to a national audience. So I, I really do appreciate the work that the Institute does. Uh, it's extremely uh, valuable on a, on, a, on a personal level. And um, I also want to thank St. Louis University for, for hosting this event. Uh, before the pandemic, I did a fair amount of speaking on, on college campuses when, when they let me. Uh, and um, uh, it's nice to be back to, to doing that again, but I know better than, than to take it for granted. Um, uh, we're at a time now when our colleges and universities seem to be getting more and more intellectually intolerant. Um, so it's good to know that we still have uh, places like this that understand the role of a college and the purpose of higher education. Um, just recently, as some of you may have heard, a federal judge was invited to speak uh, to law students at Stanford University, um, one of the most prestigious law schools in the country. Uh, protesters shouted him down. He was not allowed to finish his speech. Um, they wanted to silence him, not debate him, not critique him, but silence him. And they did so with the help of a school dean who was present at the event and sided with the protesters. Um, so this is where we are today. Uh, a few years ago, the University of Chicago began sending out letters to incoming freshmen that explain the school's commitment to academic freedom, how it does not support trigger warnings or safe spaces or cancel invited speakers because their topics might prove too controversial. Uh, this, of course, used to go without saying on college campuses. Now it needs to be stated explicitly in writing to incoming students, which again says something about where we are today. Um, obviously, college ought to be a place where students uh, and the surrounding community <laughs> are exposed to different points of view, where their sensibilities are challenged, where they learn to grapple with alternative perspectives and formulate coherent responses, uh, where you learn the difference between a slogan and an argument. Uh, on a lot of campuses, that's not happening, or at least it's not happening to the extent that it should be. Um, so again, uh, thank you for uh, taking the time to be here tonight. I, I thought I'd spend a few minutes talking about the economist Thomas Sowell, um, someone who's had a huge influence on my journalism. And I wanted to talk about why so much of his scholarship continues to be relevant to our policy debates today. Uh, when I was researching my biography, I kept coming across Sowell's own descriptions of scholars he admired. And I was often struck by how well those descriptions applied to Sowell himself. So for example, after the Nobel Prize winning economist George Stigler, who was one of Sowell's professors at the University of Chicago, passed away, uh, Sowell wrote this, in a world of self-promoting academics, George Stigler epitomized a rare integrity as well as a rare intellect. He jumped on no bandwagon, beat no drum for causes, created no personal cult. He did the work of a scholar and a teacher, both superbly, and found that sufficient. If you wanted to learn, and above all, if you wanted to learn how to think, how to avoid the vague words and fuzzy thoughts and maudlin sentiments that cloud over reality, then Stigler was your man. Or here's Tom describing another one of his mentors, Milton Friedman, whom he also studied under at Chicago. Friedman, he said, was one of the very few intellectuals with both genius and common sense. He could express himself at the highest analytical levels to his fellow economists and academic publications and still write popular books that could be readily understood by people who knew nothing about economics. I'm hard pressed 
to come up with better ways than those to describe Thomas Sowell. When I think about a scholarship, whether the topic is economics or history or culture or race or political philosophy, that's what comes to mind. Intellectual integrity, analytical rigor, respect for evidence, skepticism toward the kind of fashionable thinking that comes and goes. And then there's the clarity, in column after column, book after book, written in plain English for general public consumption. Three years ago, at the age of 90, Seoul published book number 36. The title is Charter Schools and Their Enemies. And I know educational freedom is a, a, a topic dear to the Show Me Institute. Seoul had, I hope, is not done writing books, and I don't think he is. <laughs> but if he was, you could hardly find a more suitable swan song than charter schools and their enemies for a publishing career that has now spanned six decades. Seoul's first two books were directed at students of economics, but his third book, the semi-autobiographical Black Education, Myths and Tragedies, was published in 1972 and written for the general public. Uh, it grew out of a long article on college admission standards for black students that he wrote for the New York Times Magazine back in 1970 after leaving his teaching post at Cornell. And it begins with a recounting of his own education. First, at segregated schools in North Carolina, where he was born, and later at integrated schools in New York City's Harlem neighborhood, where he was raised. The topic of education, both at the K through 12 and college level, is one that Seoul has returned to repeatedly in his books over the decades. And in the preface to Charter Schools and Their Enemies, he describes a conversation he had back in the early 1970s with Irving Kristol, who was the editor of a quarterly called The Public Interest. When Kristol asked Seoul what could be done to create high quality schools for blacks, Seoul replied that such schools already existed and had for generations. Crystal asked Seoul to write about these schools for his magazine. And a 1974 issue of The Public Interest featured a long essay by Tom on the history of all black Dunbar High School in Washington, which had not only outperformed its local white counterparts in DC, but had repeatedly equaled or excelled, uh, exceeded national norms on standardized tests throughout the first half of the 20th century. Over an 85-year span, from 1870 to 1955, Sowell wrote, most of Dunbar's graduates went on to college, even though most Americans, white or black, did not. Two years later, in the same publication, he wrote a second article on successful black elementary schools located throughout the country. In a sense, today's public charter schools, which often have predominantly low-income black and Hispanic students, are successors to these high-achieving black schools that Tom researched nearly 50 years ago. And as he points out, what's clear is that these charter schools are not simply doing a better job than traditional public schools with the same demographic groups. In many cases, inner-city charter school students are outperforming their peers in the wealthiest and whitest school districts in the country. In New York, where I'm based, for example, the Success Academy charter schools have effectively closed the achievement gap between black and white students. As Sol explains, the education success of these charter schools undermines theories of genetic determinism, undermines claims of cultural bias and test, and undermines assertions that black students must be sitting next to white students in order to learn. It undermines the presumption that family income differences explain differences in educational outcomes. In recent years, charter school skeptics have made headway. Limits have been placed on how many can open and where they can be located. Bill Clinton and Barack Obama both supported charter schools, but Democrats and progressives have moved more sharply to the left on education in more recent years. And the rhetoric coming out of the Biden administration is far more skeptical of charters, all of which make Sowell's book as timely as anything he's ever written. 
In fact, so much of soul, soul scholarship, not just on education, remains relevant to our policy debates today. We're still talking about economic inequality, affirmative action, social justice, critical race theory, slavery reparations, the efficacy of minimum wage laws, the pros and cons of immigration, and so forth. Soul's writings have addressed all of these topics. Frankly, I find it depressing that so many people today know names like ta Coates and Ibram Kendi and Nicole Hannah-Jones and Cornell West, but not Thomas Sowell. His scholarship runs circles around those individuals, maybe around all of them put together, frankly. But it's not just the volume of his writings that surpasses those other individuals. It's also the range and the depth and the rigor of his analysis, which they don't come close to matching. He anticipated many of their arguments decades ago and refuted them decades ago, in some cases before the people making them today were even born. To the extent that Sol is known, it's mostly for his writings on racial controversies. But most of his books are not on racial themes. And Sol would have distinguished himself as a first-rate scholar even if he'd never written a single word about race and ethnicity. Another reason I wanted to write the book was to showcase his writings in these other areas. Sol is an economist by training, specializing in the history of economic thought and ideas. But he's also a sociologist, a political philosopher, and a social theorist. One person described him as one of our great intellectual trespassers, someone unafraid to go wherever his talent takes him. Among his many books, Sowell says his favorite is one titled A Conflict of Visions. It's a book about the history of ideas. He tries to explain what drives our ideological disputes about freedom and equality and justice. And he traces these disagreements back at least two centuries to thinkers like the British journalist William Godwin and philosophers such as Immanuel Kant and Jean-Jacques Rousseau, down through John Rawls and the social justice theorist of today. The conflicting or contrasting visions he describes in the book are the constrained or tragic view of human nature and the unconstrained or more utopian view. People with a more constrained view of the human condition see mankind as hopelessly flawed. They see inherent limits to human betterment. We may want to end war, or poverty, or racism, for example, but that's probably not going to happen. Therefore, our focus should be on putting in place institutions and processes that help society deal with problems we're probably never going to fully solve. On the other side, you have this more unconstrained or utopian view of human nature, which basically rejects the idea that there are any limits to what humans can achieve. This is the belief that nothing is unattainable. And moreover, no trade-offs are necessary. Everything is available to all who want it. According to this perspective, through the proper amount of reason, willpower, we can not only manage problems like inequality and racism, but solve them entirely. In a conflict of visions, Sowell argues that depending on which view you embrace, there are a whole host of public policies you're likely to support or oppose. He explains why two people, similarly well-informed, similarly well-meaning, will reach opposite conclusions, not just on a given issue, but on a whole range of issues. Taxes, rent control, school choice, military spending, judicial activism, and so forth. When Immanuel Kant said that from the crooked timber of humanity, no truly straight thing was ever made, he was exhibiting the constrained view. When Rousseau said that man is born free, but everywhere in chains, he was voicing this unconstrained view. When Oliver Wendell Holmes said that his job as a judge was to make sure the game is played according to the rules, whether he liked them or not, it was the constrained view. But when Earl Warren said that his job as a justice was to do what he thinks is right, regardless of the law, 
It was the unconstrained view. This is the philosophical framework, the template, so to speak, that explains Sowell's writings on almost any topic, from economics and migration to education, race, and culture. And if you really want to understand where he's coming from, conflict divisions is where he really lays it out. Now, beginning in the 1970s, Sowell did turn his attention to these racial controversies that he's better known for. He did so, he says, out of a sense of duty. He said there were things that needed to be said, and too few people willing to say them, or say them aloud at least. Tom's criticisms of the direction of the civil rights movement at that time got him canceled, to use today's term. Black elites in particular wanted nothing to do with him because he opposed affirmative action. And they convinced others in the mainstream media not to take Tom's views seriously, not to turn to him for a black point of view on the issues of the day. Sowell has long argued that the problems blacks face today involve far more than what whites have done to them in the past. It's no mystery why black activists want to keep the focus on white racism. It helps them raise money. It helps them stay relevant. It's no mystery why politicians use the same tactics. It helps them win votes. But Sowell argued that it's not at all clear that a laser focus on white racism is helping the black underclass. You can spend all day, every day, pointing out the moral failings of other people, other groups, institutions, society in general, he's argued. The question is whether doing so helps the people who most need help. Many of today's activists go about their business with the assumption that the only real problem facing the black underclass is white racism. A good example of this is the recent focus on policing in black communities. Do racist cops exist? Absolutely. Do some cops abuse their authority? Of course. But are poor black communities so violent because of racist cops and police brutality? And will reducing police resources improve the situation? According to the Chicago Sun-Times, there were 492 homicides in Chicago in 2019, the year before the pandemic. 492. Do you know how many of them involved the police? Three. Three out of 492. If police use of lethal force is a problem in Chicago, it's clearly a secondary problem. During one weekend in Chicago a few years ago, 74 people were shot. One of the local hospital emergency rooms had to shut down, turn away ambulances, because it didn't have room for any more bodies. Again, none of these shootings involved police, not one. Young black men in Chicago or Baltimore or St. Louis may indeed leave the house each morning worrying about getting shot, but not by a cop. Will reducing police resources really solve this problem? And is it what people who live in high crime neighborhoods really want? Fewer police? A couple years ago, there was a ballot measure put to voters in Minneapolis where George Floyd was killed that would have reduced police funding. Not only was it defeated, it was most strongly opposed by black residents in high crime areas who want more policing, not less. And the black residents of Minneapolis are not outliers here. They're typical. A Gallup poll released in 2020 found that 81% 80, of blacks nationwide said they wanted police presence in their neighborhood to remain the same or to increase. 81%. Another Gallup poll released a year earlier asked black and Hispanic residents of low-income in neighborhoods in particular about policing. 59% of both blacks and Hispanic respondents said they wanted police to spend more time in their neighborhoods. Efforts to defund the police are being pushed by activists and liberal elites who claim to be speaking on behalf of low-income minorities. But as the polling shows, they're mainly speaking for themselves. This is something Sol pointed out a long, long time ago. 
In the course of doing research for the book, I went through scores of interviews that Sol had done over the decades. He would often be asked how it felt to go against the grain of so many other blacks. Sol would inevitably correct the premise of the question. You don't mean I go against the grain of most blacks, he would respond. You mean I go against the grain of most black intellectuals, most black elites. But black intellectuals don't represent most blacks any more than white intellectuals represent most whites, he would say. <laughs> this continues to be the case today. Most blacks, for example, support voter ID laws and school choice. While most black elites, your academics, your NAACP, your Black Lives Matter activists and so forth, oppose those things. Conversely, most blacks oppose racial preferences in college admissions. And as I just noted, oppose defunding the police. While black elites are in favor of those things. Sol pointed out these disparities decades ago, and they've only grown since then. His writings on intellectual history have stressed time and again that intellectuals are a special interest group with their own self-serving agenda and priorities and ought to be understood as such. I often tell people that if you think Ta-Nehisi Coates and Nicole Hannah-Jones represent the views of most black people, you need to get to know more black people. <laughs> Sol has been right about this stuff for a very, very long time. So why does Tom Sol still matter? Here's why. Sol will turn 93 this year. The book he published in 2020, as I mentioned, was book number 36. It was also his fifth book since turning 80. That's not too bad for a black orphan from the Jim Crow South who was born into extreme poverty during the Great Depression who never finished high school, who didn't earn a college degree until he was 28 years old, and who didn't write his first book until he was 40. But even aside from that impressive personal journey, Sol is a rare species. He's an honest intellectual. He's someone who has consistently sought out the truth, regardless of whether it made him popular. He's been willing to follow the facts and the evidence where they lead, even when they lead to politically incorrect results. It's not something that ought to distinguish you as a scholar, but these days it does. Think about the current debate we're having over critical race theory. These ideas were once relegated to college seminars. Now they're entering our workplaces through diversity training and they're entering our elementary schools through the New York Times 1619 project, headed by Nicole Hannah-Jones, which attempts to put the institution of slavery at the center of America's founding, which is absurd. Slavery existed for thousands of years in societies all over the world, long before the founding of the United States. More African slaves were sent to the Islamic world than were ever sent to the Americas. Slavery still exists, places like Sudan and Nigeria. What makes America unique is not slavery, it's emancipation. It's how fast we went from slavery to a Martin Luther King to a black president. The economic and social progress of black Americans in only a few generations is something historians have described as unmatched in recorded history. That is what makes America unique. These facts about slavery are well known among serious historians. But where are these serious historians right now? A few have come forward, sure. People like Sean Lentz and Gordon Wood and James McPherson and, and some others. But why so relatively few? Why isn't the head of every history department at every major university pushing back against the 1619 Project nonsense being peddled by the New York Times and Nicole Hannah-Jones and now infiltrating our K-12 education system? The nation's top scholars 
ought to be falling over one another denouncing this stuff. Why have so many been so quiet? There have been countless books written by serious scholars about our nation's founding. And none of those books were written by Nicole Hannah-Jones. Why are serious historians so afraid to take on a journalist who has never written a book, never written a serious academic paper about anything, let alone about the history of slavery and our nation's founding? The reason they are so afraid of her is because she is taking, taking her on as politically incorrect. They will be called racist. They will be called sexist. It might damage their academic careers. This is the sort of intellectual cowardice that makes Soul's life work unique. This is what distinguishes his scholarship, courage. Soul wasn't afraid. It's the sort of thing that ought to be commonplace among scholars and intellectuals and journalists for that matter, but clearly it is not. Sowell has spent a career putting truth above popularity, and I think we need a hundred more just like him. Thank you. First one right here. Good evening. Uh, did you title your book before or after the movie came out? <laughs> the book uh, predates the, the movie, but uh, <laughs> yes. Uh. You say so. <laughs> So I have the misfortune of being on, on Twitter, and Nicole Hannah-Jones complained that everyone keeps telling her to read Soul. Uh, and she tweeted about this, and her response has always been, who is this Soul? What has he ever done? And what are, what are his qualifications? And uh, so my question, my question is, what is it that brings someone to respond that way to someone who is clearly more qualified and they have nothing. Is it something about this topic? Something about the, the sociology of, of this, this well, debate? Well, I think primarily it's, it's, it's the effectiveness of the cancellation that occurred before Nicole Hannah-Jones was born. I mean, Soul was out there talking about these things in the 1970s and the 1980s, and he took a real beating. Um, from the uh, black leadership, the civil rights leadership. Um, and it was quite effective. Um, and uh, as I said, it, they, they, they attempted to cancel him. And um, I think uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones' uh, lack of knowledge about his work or lack of respect uh, about his work is, is evidence that, that the left um, succeeded. You know, even people who are familiar with, um, with Tom's work um, feel justified in dismissing him out of hand and not even engaging. I, I write about that in the, in the book. They, they really don't engage um, his arguments. Um, I won't say it's never happened, but it's extremely rare. Uh, the tendency is to simply uh, dismiss him, pretend he doesn't exist. And, um, and I think this is what you're seeing reflected in those comments. To piggyback on what you were just saying, I mean, I don't know if there's a person in America that deserves a, a Nobel Prize in economics more than him, than, than, than he does. And I mean, you obviously you know, know him. I mean, how does he feel about the fact that, I mean, he has been so, the, the institutions, it seems, not just, you know, someone like Nicole Hannah-Jones, who's to some extent, had, you know, an intellectual nobody, but like the, you know, the prestigious institutions seem to just ignore him as well. And I mean, it, it has to anger him. I mean, the, the well, lack. 
he, he is not someone, um, and I do get into this somewhat in the book, but he is not someone looking for personal acclamation. He, he is interested in having his ideas out there. Um, but the awards and the prizes, um, that, that doesn't much interest him. Uh, but uh, his willingness to say the things he said he knows has cost him uh, on, on some level. You know, he simply has refused to play footsie with the people who give out the prizes and the awards and, and, and the university. I mean, I, I should back up and just tell you a little bit about his career before he joined the think tank world. Sowell spent the 1960s and 70s in academia. Um, and that was his first love, teaching. Uh, he wanted to teach economics, and he did in the 60s and 70s. But this was, of course, a time when uh, academia was changing. Um, you had a, a, a civil rights movement, a women's rights movement, a gay rights movement, an anti-war movement. They were all using the universities as platforms. Uh, uh, higher education had no idea what to do about the situation. And a lot of uh, times they ended up indulging this sort of thing. Um, Sol wanted to teach economics. And he wanted to teach it the way he had been taught in the 50s. Um, and uh, in early 60s uh, by people like Friedman and Stigler who were really no-nonsense type professors. And so when Sol is at Cornell or in the 60s or at UCLA in the 70s and students are, you know, no, you cannot be excused from class to go to an anti-war rally. No, we are not going to spend this period uh, discussing current events in the headlines. I'm here to teach economics. You're here to learn economics. Let's open our books. That attitude was um, uh, less and less tolerated in academia, uh, beginning in the in the mid to late '60s, and um, and I think it ultimately drove him out of academia and into the think tank world. Uh, he did not want to bend with the times. Um, partly that was just his personality, but he also believed that you know his role was to teach the kids ac uh, economics. And, and not indulge them in the way that uh, a lot of other people in the faculty lounge um, wanted to. And, uh, you know, if you want to stay in academia, um, sometimes you have to bend in ways he was unwilling to do so. <coughs> you, or you could just be a pariah on campus. <laughs> but um, most people don't want to be a pariah on campus, and so they do bend. Um, but I think that's a. It tells you a little bit about his, his personality and his background. But the, you know, I've, I talk to people who say they wish he had stuck it out. There are people that did. You know, Milton Friedman taught um, till he won the Nobel Prize in the 1970s, and then he left uh, Chicago after that. Um, you know, Walter Williams, uh, another black economist, similar views to Seoul, um, died a few years ago. He was still teaching in those 80s. Um, so there were some who were willing to do it, uh, but many were not. Many were not in Seoul. And, and, and there, as Seoul would be the first to acknowledge, there are trade-offs. Had he stayed in academia, it had, we had thousands or tens of thousands of graduate students that had studied under him, maybe there'd be a lot more people out there talk, sounding like Tom Seoul. Instead, he left academia. He went to the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. Um, and he's been churning out the books. Um, we probably wouldn't have the books if he stayed in the teaching. We probably wouldn't have all the columns. Personally, I wouldn't give up those books for anything. But, um, but there are trade-offs there. Yeah. Yes, I thought it was very interesting what you said about the success of the charter schools in New York. And we support the... Um, Hawthorne Girls School in St. Louis, which has tried very hard to get great teachers and really do a good job. And uh, their students have struggled and not done as well as we th had thought. And I wondered, what is the secret sauce of the Dunbar, or the, the schools that, that you followed? What do, what do we need to do that we're not doing in our charter schools? What's the secret sauce? Is it maybe starting younger, or what is it? 
Well, I, I don't know that there is a, a secret sauce um, other than um, the ability to innovate. I mean, what, that, what charters can do, uh, they are able to do because they are not um, forced to submit to many of the rules that uh, traditional public schools, they can adapt. They can have a longer school day. They can have a longer school year. Um, if they need more math teachers, they can pay them more money uh, to meet that need. Um, they can fire teachers that are bad. Um, th th that is the secret sauce. It's the ability to, uh, to adapt uh, to the needs of the, of the kids you're trying to serve. Uh, and it's also being held accountable. If you're a charter school and you're not succeeding, you close. If you're a traditional public school that is not succeeding, you are able to stay up, uh, stay open, and, and continue to fail generation after generation after generation of kids. Um, uh, so that's, you know, that, it, it's, it's competition. I mean, I, 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 I've often likened the, the situation with charters uh, to the post office. Um, I mean, many of us are old enough to, 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 to remember when the post office was much worse than it is today. And things improved not because the Postal Service said, you know what, we're just going to get our act together and do a better job. <laughs> That's not what happened. What happened was Federal Express. What happened was UPS. And, 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 and that is, you know, the, the charter school movement is not about shutting down traditional public schools. It's about applying pressure on them to improve by creating a competitive market for kids and quality education. Uh, so that's the, you know, that's the real secret sauce, I would say. Um, uh, the, the, the schools have to understand that if they don't do their job, uh, the kids and the money that follows the kids will, will go somewhere else. Um, so, um, I grew up in a communist country, and what I'm seeing here is a lot of the stuff you're talking about is really a Marxist, uh, socialist type of um, ideology which is coming here. So, my question for you is, what can we do to change the narrative and maybe bring us back to the to sort of what, what, we're, what we came up with? this country with individual liberty, responsibility, and opportunity? Well, I think the ideas you see out there have always been out there. Um, they just haven't been as prominent um, as they are today. But, but you're right that the progressives have been ascendant in this country for, for some years now. Um, and it is upsetting, and it is uh, destructive, but I, I kind of think they're uh, they're overselling it. I, I, I don't think that um, the American people are really with with them. I don't think they're a majority of the population. I don't think they're a majority of the Democratic Party. Um, but right now they are wagging the dog, and 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 I think they're. I think the pendulum has swung too far. I mean, we we are at a point now where um, people are calling math racist. Punctuality is white supremacy. Um, people who swam on the men's team two years ago are now swimming on the women's team, and you're not supposed to notice. And you're not supposed to say anything about it. And if you do, they tell you to go crawl back into your cave. That, most Americans aren't on board with that. And, and so I, I really think you're, you're seeing pushback. You're seeing it at the, at the parental level. Um, there have been a debate, debates in, in a number of states over uh, specialized schools that require uh, a test to get in. Uh, the progressives have come after those schools in New York, in Virginia, in California, in Massachusetts. And a lot of parents have been, have been pushing back. Even in really liberal cities like San Francisco, you see pushback on these efforts. Um, so I'm, 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 I'm hopeful that, um, that we can turn things around. But you are right, it's, it's, it's a, it is a, somewhat disturbing 
that were you know, tearing down statues of Abraham Lincoln and erecting statues of George Floyd. Um, that's, a little, that's a little disturbing. So my, my day job is a professor in a college of education. I also have four children, two are in high school, and so I'm often thinking about how do we get kids to start thinking about and understanding these ideas of liberty? With Thomas Sowell, I've got so many books to choose from. If you had just a one or two that you would suggest for high school readers, uh, what would be the ones that stand out? <laughs> um, well, I mean, I wasn't like this in high school, man. <laughs> I, was, I was not chasing down Thomas Sowell books in high school. Um, I was chasing other things. <laughs> uh, I discovered Sowell in college. Uh, but um, um, in terms of books, for, for, for an introduction to Sowell, I mean, I spoke about the book con he considers his most important conflict of visions, but that is not, uh, I wouldn't recommend that as an introduction to Thomas Sowell. Uh, for, for a younger person, there was a book he published, I want to say, um, I want to say 2012, uh, called The Thomas Sowell Reader. And it's a, it's a collection of columns and some book chapters on, on any number of issues, uh, uh, economics, uh, history, um, uh, race, um, uh, international uh, uh, issues, foreign policy. And it's a nice sampling. Uh, and it doesn't need to be read from front to back. You can pick and choose, and there's a nice index. Uh, that might be a good place to, um, to start to whet someone's appetite. And then if you want to go a little deeper, um, uh, you, can, you can go from there. But Sol is, um, he is someone who probably would have appealed to me if I had read him in, in high school, because he, he's writing for a general interest audience. One of the things he got from his mentor, Milton Friedman, was a, a sense of the importance of um, being able to explain your discipline to non-intellectuals. Friedman, after he left uh, Chicago, uh, went on the public speaking circuit. He um, wrote general interest books. He did a television show. Um, he thought it was very, very important that intellectuals just don't sit around talking to one another, that they explain themselves <coughs> to the general public. And Sowell has, um, most of his books are directed at the general public. I mean, he's written books for other intellectuals, but most of his books are, are written um, for the general public. And I think uh, a sort of uh, precocious teenager could get a lot of it. <coughs> I probably wasn't that teenager, but, uh, <laughs> but maybe, yeah. Thank you, Jason, for, those, for what you've been sharing with us. My question is, how do we get rid of these people that look like us, that finesse us, and to help people make sense in their pockets, their hearts, and in, the, in, the, and in the ballots, because the people that look like us selling us dreams and living, when we look at the leave nightmares, and I, every time I see a quote on Twitter from Mr. Soul, if that's even him, I, I mean, I'm, I'm loving it. It gives me inspiration. And listening to you and some of your others in your comments, I think we need to open up a, a school or like an institute, because SLPS has something that blocks us from creating charter schools in their buildings, but can we create a Thomas Sowell Institute for kids that live on the west side that don't want to be a part of the narrative that, that highlights death, dope, and urban decay? Well, I, I think we, um, first, one of the reasons I, I wanted to write the book, and uh, in addition to the book, I narrated a, a documentary film for public television about Sowell. Um, and one of the reasons I wanted to do both things was to reach younger younger audiences. Um, and I think there's been some success, particularly with the documentary, because uh, it was available on, on YouTube, and after it was available on public television, it was available on Amazon and YouTube, where you could track the demographics of who was streaming it. And um, 
they tended to be younger. You know, people in their 20s and 30s, and in some cases, 40s. And so, um, thanks to social media, I mean, you mentioned the Twitter account. Um, he is, we are reaching, we are reaching a younger generation with these ideas, and they're very appealing. He's, he's very popular on YouTube. I mean, he's all over social media. He's, he's not on social media. He's, he's not on Twitter. Someone started a fan account. Uh, I interviewed this person for the book. Um, random 30-something-year-old Midwestern guy um, who's in advertising, digital advertising, uh, for a living. Uh, heard Soul on a talk radio show, maybe if it was Dennis Prager or somebody like that being interviewed some years ago. Uh, started a Twitter fan account. All he does on this account is quote directly from Soul's books or columns. That's it. There's no added commentary, just direct quotes. The account today, I believe, has around a million followers. And so that, that shows you the appeal of unvarnished Thomas Sowell. <laughs> Um, and I think it's encouraging. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any colleges or universities that teach the sole school of thought, or is it completely blacked out in the larger universities, or, or well, any universities? Well, I mean, you, you do have. Um, so, you know, some economics departments that are still known to um, give some space to free market ideas. Chicago is still, is still one of them. Um, and you have some more conservative schools like Hillsdale, I think. Um, uh, so, uh, so yeah, I mean, they're, they're out there. Uh, I've, I've been pleasantly surprised at uh, how many times I've seen his books on um, curricula given out to students. Uh, nowadays, uh, which is interesting. Um, um, uh, so, you know, I, uh, uh, there's hope. He hasn't been completely uh, blotted from, uh, from academia in that sense. Um, you know, but I, I don't think he's given, uh, you know, nearly the attention he, he deserves. Um, uh, I think that's the problem. Thank, thank you for a great book and a great talk. Uh, my question relates to Dunbar High School. Was it ever a selective admission high school, the, the one in D.C.? Um, no, I don't think it was. I don't think it was, but I just it wondered. It was a, um, uh, when, when it first opened, it's, it's existed under several names. I mean, I think it's, I think it might still exist today. But um, when it first opened, I think it was the first academic, black academic school right. in D.C. Uh, there were other high schools, but they were more technical schools. This was the first academic high school. And no, I don't believe there was, a, there was an admissions uh, test requirement. Uh, what is interesting about the admission schools, however, is that um, you know, we have this debate in New York over these selective schools that, you know, there are eight, there are eight of them uh, that rely on a single test for admission. And um, uh, in a given year, uh, you know, Asian students are getting 60, 50, 60 percent of the slots, even though they're only something like 12 percent of the, 15 percent of the New York City public school population. Um, but if you go back, 40, 50 years, these selective high schools in New York had a higher percentage of black students than they have today. Um, and again, these are test, these are test schools, uh, which says a few things about the test, which is whether the test is the issue. Uh, first, but second, if the test is racist, why is it that Asians, a racial minority group, do the best on it? Um, <laughs> What are uh, Soul's thoughts on turning this thing around? Does he have any hope that we can uh, stop this <laughs> craziness and get some sanity uh, going? He's not a person I would turn to for hope. <laughs> 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 if you want hope, a hopeful message, if you want sunshine, 
Tom is not your guy. He's, 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 he, he very much embraces that tragic view of human nature. <laughs> The world has been going to hell in a, in a handbasket for 50 years, or longer, if you ask Tom. Uh, uh, but no, he, what, what, what he has spotted, what, what, what I appreciate about his writings is how early he saw some of these developments coming on. Um, you can go back and read columns and books he wrote in the, in the, in the 70s and early 80s, and if you, and you go, wow, he was so right about this. He called this 40 years ago, 50 years ago. Um, he saw it coming. And, I, and, 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 um, and he not only, what what's, what's, what's I find um, uh, so impressive about his scholarship is uh, it's often full of international comparisons. He doesn't limit his analysis to what's going on in the US. And there's an understanding there that basically nothing that happens in the U.S. has only happened in the U.S. It's probably happened in dozens of other countries um, many, many more times. <laughs> and if you bother to go and, and study the, the, the developments of these other societies outside of the U.S., it again, it's no surprise that it's happening here. Um, and, and his work is full of international comparisons about trends in society. And I, um, and, and I think uh, it, it makes it all the more essential reading. Um, and this will be our last question. That's a lot of pressure. I didn't expect to be the last question. <laughs> <laughs> Within the next couple months, it's widely expected that the Supreme Court will rule that the use of race-based affirmative action in higher education is unconstitutional. And I think over the next few years, we're likely to see uh, a continuation of that uh, in terms of ruling that the consideration of race in, uh, in really all aspects of government um, are unconstitutional. We usually think of, of law and politics as being downstream from, downstream from culture. Do you think there's an opportunity in this case for, for culture and politics to be, to be downstream of the law? Is that an, an opportunity we can take advantage of in terms of the the broader cultural fight that you're talking about? Well, well first, this is another area that, that, that Tom called out a long time ago. Um, you know, we've had racial preferences in earnest really since the 1970s, and he was a very early critic of them and said they would not accomplish what people think they will accomplish. Um, um, and they haven't. Uh, uh, I think I agree with you that the, uh, the conventional wisdom, which I share, is that the court is going to limit these programs, and the only question is by how much. Um, I think that what we are going to see in response to a ruling uh, that I'm anticipating is resistance. Resistance that I can only liken to what we saw after Brown versus Board of Education in the South, where you had state and local governments saying, we do not care what the Supreme Court just said. We are not integrating. And it took more lawsuits. It took, in some cases, troops being sent down south to enforce this ruling. I think you're going to see similar resistance. The left hates this comparison, of course. but. They are going to be playing the role of the Southern segregationists after this ruling comes down, if it comes down the way I think. They are going to resist. They are going to find end runs uh, uh, around following the law, and it will. This is only getting started. This is something I think um, you're going to have to see many more lawsuits filed to enforce uh, whatever the Supreme Court decides, and and I think it's going to be ugly. But I, I think they're locked in to this uh, diversity rationale. Um, I mean, these schools, these schools are, 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 are this, this is a war on meritocracy that I find extremely, extremely disturbing and, and, and almost nonsensical given their views about how racism is everywhere in US society. If that's true, then objective standards are your best friend. I mean, 100 years ago, 
the administrators at Harvard would say to Jews, oh, yes, you're very smart. Um, uh, you have the grades, but you know, you're, not, you're just not the Harvard type, sorry. They were running, this was holistic review. This was the personality test that Asians are currently failing at Harvard. You have the grades, you have the GPA, you have the class rank, but you know, sorry. If, if you believe that racism is around every corner in American society, has infiltrated every institution, it seems to me that you would want to be able to go to a school and say, oh, no, my kid has the grades. My kid has the class rank, he has the SAT score, and he deserves to be in this school. And yet, they are at war with meritocracy. Not just at the college level, they want to end it at these specialized schools. Um, they, want to, they want to get rid of the SAT. Um, as if getting rid of the SAT or getting rid of standardized tests will close the achievement gap. It won't. It'll just obscure the achievement gap. I mean, Sol has often said, you know, if you want to help a group, you know, you need to know where they are, not where you hope they are, because they can only get where you want them to go from where they are. We stop giving people tests because we're afraid of the, of the test score. <laughs> You're not helping them. Uh, yet that is the road we're on right now. Um, so I find it very disturbing. But I, I think in, in, in terms of the Supreme Court case, um, it's, it, it's just the beginning. I, I really do think it's just the beginning. I don't expect the left to throw up their hands and go, oh, well, we'll we're going to go back to um, objective standards of admissions in higher education. Thank you.